All right, good afternoon, everyone. Just a few things at the top, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. So as you know, the Secretary has been on travel to the Indo-Pacific for the last week, and today he wraps up his trip in Jakarta, Indonesia. Throughout the Secretary's visit to, in to India, Republic of Korea, and Indonesia, the common thread across all of his engagements have been a shared commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific. He heard directly from allies and partners who expressed their support for this goal, and the Department will continue to work closely with ASEAN to promote a regional order based on the rule of law, respect for sovereignty, and ter territorial integrity. Also during his trip, the Secretary had the opportunity to speak with co his counterparts from the Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia to discuss a number of bilateral initiatives. Now, as you saw last night, President Biden and President Xi committed to the resumption of high-level military-to-military communication. Additionally, the U.S. and the PRC agreed to resuming telephone conversations between their theater commanders. Secretary Austin welcomes this announcement and will meet with his counterpart when that person is named. As these agreements were just reached yesterday, we know that we have work to do with the PRC military to solidify these principles for actions. We will keep you informed as, as these procedures are codified and when we schedule our first meetings and calls. And as Secretary Austin has said, maintaining open lines of communications between our two militaries is essential to avoid misunderstandings and miscalculations that could lead to a crisis or a conflict. Switching gears, earlier this morning, Congress avoided a government shutdown by passing the bipartisan continuing resolution, which I believe is headed to the president's desks, desk for him to sign. This short-term CR will ensure that our, troop, our troops and civilian workforce will be paid through the holidays. However, the department continues to urge Congress to pass a full year appropriations, which is the best thing that Congress can do for our national defense. As we have long made clear, operating under a short-term continuing resolution hamstrings the department's peoples and our programs and undermines both our national security and competitiveness. We also urge Congress to pass our supplemental funding request that would allow us to keep supporting Ukraine and Israel, uh, providing life-saving humanitarian assistance across the globe, and makes critical investments in the Indo-Pacific. The supplemental ju doesn't just meet today's urgent challenges, but also invests in our industrial base here at home, because as we send munitions from our stockpiles, the money to replenish our supplies invests in the American industry and American workers. These investments will mean greater prosperity at home and greater security abroad. And that's why we have submitted this urgent supplemental request, uh, sorry, supplemental budget request to help fund America's national security needs and to stand by our partners and to invest in our defense industrial base. And lastly, also in Congress, um, an additional three nominations were submitted to the Senate, which means there are now 455 nominations concerning 451 general and flag officers who are currently impacted by Senator Tom Tuberville's holds. We are encouraged by the efforts in the Senate to find a way to confirm all of our qualified nominees, given that these holds, as you've heard me say many times before, have an impact to our readiness, our national security, and our military families. These holds have lasted far too long, and every day that goes by, our department and our force suffer from them. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Lita. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, one quick question on uh, China. Do you know when the last time the so-called red phone or whatever it was, it was called was used between the U.S. and China? And if you don't, if you could just, can you take that? Yeah, I think I took a question. Um, similar to that last time when I was up here. So yeah, I'm happy to take that question. Okay. Yeah. And then. Um, the U.S. has now shot down um, a drone that was headed in the direction of the Hudner, mm -hmm. and the Houthis have also shot down a U.S. drone. Do you believe that this drone was headed for the Hudner? Because the release says that the ship took self-defense action. Mm -hmm. Do you dispute it was headed for the Hudner? Do you think it was or do you think it wasn't? And then, if so, at what point does the U.S. take some sort of action against the Houthis for these two very direct attacks on the U.S.? So in um, I'll take your last question first. So in terms of action, um, as you've heard me say before, but we always reserve the right um, to respond at a time and place of our choosing. I don't have anything to preview from here today, um, and I won't get ahead of any decisions that the secretary or that the president decides to make. Um, in terms of the... Uh, uh, assessment that it, where where the drone was headed. 
Um, our assessment right now is that the intended target was not the Hudner, but that the drone got so close to the crew that the commander did feel it necessary to engage and shoot down the drone. Um, and I'm sorry, did you have one more question that I'm forgetting? Um, no, yeah, because it was self it, yeah. it was self defense, correct? Yeah. So it was not targeting the Hudner, you believe, or what's our assessment? Because there was some mm -hmm. an assessment that it was targeting. Our assessment right now is that it was not targeting the Hudner, but it was headed in that general direction. Um, and also, just to sorry, very quickly go back to your first question on mill to mill communications. I should have also clarified that while I'm happy to take the question, there of course have been communications between our ships within the region where there are, you know, moments where, you know, there is deconfliction used. I think you're more specifically asking on like a high level. And that higher level yep. drone that was set up uh, a number of years ago and it yeah. was used on and off, but had yeah, I just didn't off. want you to think like there, you know, there, while there have not been high level mill to mill communications between the secretary and his counterpart um, at a you know lower levels in theater, there have been communications to deconflict from crises. Idris. Um, two questions. First, sure. yesterday, uh, President Biden made a bunch of remarks about Israel. And one of the ones he made was he talked about how doctors and nurses were now being allowed to El Shifa, but then added that quote unquote, what was occurring before with indiscriminate bombing by the Israelis. Do you agree with President Biden that there were indiscriminate bombings by Israel or with Israel that was saying that their bombings were precision strikes? Well, I can't remember his exact context, but I think what he was referring to, and I'm you know, not looking at the remarks, but was that we didn't want to see uh, indiscriminate bombing around or in to the hospital. So what the IDF did was go into the hospital with more precision. It wasn't, you know, I think the president referenced this, there wasn't carpet bombing around the hospital or at the hospital itself. So I don't disagree with what the president said or in his remarks, but I think what you saw when it came to the Al Shifa hospital in particular is that the IDF was um, going in with, with with more precision, and um, you know, we said all along from this podium and from others across the administration that we never wanted to see a firefight within the hospital. Um, we never wanted to see innocent civilians get caught in those crossfires. Um, and so, I, I think that's what the president was was speaking to. And then, secondly, I think mm -hmm. uh, in your last briefing, you said that Hamas and PIJ were operating a command and control node from yeah. Al Shif Hospital. The Israelis have put out several videos over the past 24 hours of evidence um, of what they say, you know, are Hamas weapons, a couple of machine yeah. guns, etc. But no real evidence of any command and control nodes in the traditional sense. Um, do you still stand by your assessment, and have you asked the Israelis to? provide evidence um, of that. Yeah, well, we still stand by the assessment that, that I think I read out on Tuesday, which what you're referring to is that we know Hamas has used hospitals like Al-Shifa to operate out of um, to conceal their military operations. I mean, taking a step back, a hospital should never be used for that to begin with. So however you define it, a command and control center node, um, a means of operating uh, terrorist actions out of a hospital, that should never happen to begin with. Um, we stand by the the downgraded intelligence that I announced on Tuesday that um, we know they were using Al-Shifa Hospital. We know that they use other hospitals in the region um, when it comes to conducting their terrorist um, organizations and um, attacks. And so, um, yes, we stand by that, but we know, and you, I think, alluded to this as well, that the Israelis are there. They are doing an assessment of the hospital. They are on the ground. And so, you know, we'll continue to receive that um, intelligence back as we get it. Plan on releasing any evidence to that intelligence? Um, I'm not going to get ahead of anything right now. I don't have anything to, to preview. But if we do, you'll, you will be the first to know. Liz. Thank you. Um, there have been 58 attacks on U.S. Uh, forces in Iraq and Syria over the last month. Um, there's been seven since Sunday's U.S. airstrikes in Syria. Um, so the rate is not slowing down of these attacks. Is the Pentagon waiting for a service member to be killed before taking stronger, more effective action? No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I, we would never want to see that. We would never want that to be the outcome of any attack. Um, I think, you know, taking a step back here, as you mentioned, yes, there have been 58 attacks on our service members um, since October 17th. Um, 
all of which have been unsuccessful. Um, they have not caused significant damage to infrastructure, and they have not caused significant injury to any of our service members. And all of our service members who have been injured have all returned to duty. So absolutely not are we waiting for an attack to inflict more damage um, to alter our response. I think you saw our responses of our last three strikes hit um, one of them hit a command and control node um, that was operating in a safe house. The others hit weapons storage facilities um, and a training facility. So our attacks have significantly downgraded and degraded, I should say, um, the access that these militia groups have to these weapons. And so um, we're not we're not waiting on something to act. We are we have responded, and if there are more attacks. Um, we will certainly respond um, at a time and place of our choosing. On a, Did you have on another? A, sorry. Totally yeah. separate topic mm -hmm. on the audit. Uh, so the mm -hmm. Pentagon just failed its sixth audit, I believe. Um, what message are you concerned that sends a bad message to um, U.S. adversaries or U.S. allies? And if the Pentagon can't pass its own audit, how can the American people trust what weapons it's sending to Ukraine and Israel? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're working on improving our process. Um, while it wasn't the results that we wanted, um, we certainly are learning each time an audit passes, and uh, you know it, it's a continuing it's a continuing and ongoing process that this building is assessing. Um, one of the things that the audit did do this time around was it informed how um, what we had for how we could supply Ukraine, and then when um, the events of October seventh happened and um, the need to assess what we could supply Israel, um, we were informed very much by the results of the audit from, you know, our, our looking all across the entire, uh, entire building here, um, but also what we had provided for Ukraine. So again, it's a complicated process and it's a complicated um, undertaking that this building has, has done, um, but we feel confident in what we are learning each time. Natasha, yeah. Um, the Pentagon keeps saying that there have been no serious injuries from these attacks, yeah. but more than two dozen service members have suffered traumatic brain injury, which mm -hmm. seems like a very serious injury. So I'm just wondering, how are you defining that, and how are you defining unsuccessful? And then my second question is, if you have any updates on the five, um, the search for the search and recovery efforts for the five special operations soldiers who died last week. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll take the last one first. So, of course, um, I don't, I can't remember if I even, if I addressed this last time, but, you know, that's our thoughts and prayers are, of course, with the families who lost their loved ones um, over this last weekend in a, in a training incident. Um, in terms of any updates on those service members, I, I would prefer you to the Army. They would have the latest uh, for you. Um, in terms of the injuries, again, I, I know TBI, of course, that's something that, um, Anytime one of our service members is injured, whether it's serious or not, we certainly take it seriously as a department. Um, you know, two of our service members did go to launch school for further evaluation. They were returned to duty soon after. Um, so, of course, we take any injury serious, seriously, but these were not serious injuries. And I think that's important to remember. The United States took military action three different times and fully degraded some of their face. So I think um, in terms of our response, we've been very effective in responding back and sending a message to Iran. Constantine. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. On the Hubner, um, sure. can you say how close the drone got to the ship? I can't say how close it got. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't actually know how close it got, but it got close enough to the ship that the commander felt that it needed to engage the drone. And uh, can you say what weapon system the ship used to engage the drone? I can. Yeah. Tony. Back to the audit, the famous failed verb. Mm -hmm. uh, it got a disclaimer. I was surprised. I, you know, Liz took your question. I felt like I, I knew you were coming around to this. So, I don't really care. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the disclaimer issue. Uh -huh. what, are the, what do the best minds in the building uh, assess when you may get a clean audit opinion? How many years might that be? Since getting the sixth audit mm -hmm. took years and years to prepare, is there a ballpark estimate you can give? How many years will it take to get a clean audit opinion in all 29 of these component audits? 
You know, Tony, I'm not going to lie, I'm not an expert on the audit, but I what I can tell you is that we do have those experts in the building, and I'm not going to get ahead of them or predict on when we are going to get a clean audit. What I can say is every time we go through this process, we are learning, we are improving, and um, we put into place uh, measures that certainly monitor how we spend money. But again, there are people in this building directly focused on that. Can you take that for a, a question? I mean, well, that's a hypothetical question that I can't really get it, get it, get into. And well, I can't predict the future. I can't predict when we're going to get to what you're asking and, and they won't be able to either. That's why each time we go through this audit process, even if it is our sixth time, we keep going through the process. We keep getting better and better at it. And when we get there, Tony, I, I will let you know. It's a known unknown. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Fadi. Thank you, Sabina. I have one a question and then a follow-up. Sure. You. So um, you stated that, you know, uh, the Hamas were using a Shifa hospitals to conduct uh, their attacks. Uh, and then you, you referenced the, the assessment, intelligence assessment. When you, when you talk about this, can you be more specific? Are based on your assessment, do you have any proof that Hamas used the building itself, which is a big building, or are you referring to the underneath the building in conducting these activities? Well, I think if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me, but I think Al Shifa Hospital actually has multiple buildings. Um, so what we know is Hamas was using Al Shifa Hospital. I can't tell you specifically if it was just one building or multiple, but we, they were using the hospital to operate out of. That should stand alone as a, a place of concern. You have many injured civilians getting treatment there. You have um, babies who were just born. I don't think operating a terrorist cell out of a hospital is a way to conduct any operation, but they were doing that. So it's important to, to point that out. Um, but in terms of more specifics on when, where in the hospital, that, that I don't have. That's still something that I've seen um, the IDF is there and doing their assessment of you know where the um, Hamas leadership was operating out of, but what I can say and what I've said before is that we know that they were operating out of that hospital. And, and thank you. And uh -huh. then, um, so, and you said we don't want to see a firefight inside the hospital. Yeah, I said that on Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. And, and again today. Um, mm -hmm. So the Israelis raided the hospital. There was no firefight because they didn't find any Hamas fighters. Um, do you, does the Pentagon support uh, these types of activities by the IDF raiding hospitals? Well, look, that's something for the IDF to really speak to. We have been very clear with our Israeli counterparts, with Minister Gallant, the secretary has you know, engaged with him almost regularly, almost daily, that um, innocent civilians, um, people in hospitals uh, that are seeking care, their lives need to be protected and they need to be um, that the IDF, as they conduct their operations, need to f uphold humanitarian laws and the law of war. But that's how complex and complicated this entire operation is for the IDF. The fact that you have a terrorist organization embedded or at least using and operating out of a hospital, that makes any operation for any military in the world incredibly complex. And so um, that's something that the IDF would have to speak to in terms of their operations, but uh, we never want to see any type of terrorist organization operating out of a hospital, using it as a command and control center, um, because that does put innocent lives at risk. And that's what they were doing. That's they're putting these people, using them as human shields, um, you know, for 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 what? And so I, th I think it's just important. You make you raise an excellent question, but I think it's also important to remember why these people were put in that position to begin with. Wafa. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. So can you please update us uh, on the department level of engagement in daily military operations in Gaza? Uh, and also when you say you're engaged, like there's daily mm -hmm. uh, interaction or you reach out to the Israelis on a daily basis, do they actually listen to you when you <coughs> express concerns or ask questions about the military operations? Sure. Um, so as as you mentioned, and, I, and I've said, we, we do have daily conversation or near daily conversations with the Israeli government. That's from the secretary. Um, but of course, there are levels all across this government that are also having those conversations. Um, I'm not going to go into more details of those conversations other than, you know, we do put out a readout each time. You can certainly see a common thread of what we're emphasizing in those readouts that 
yes, Israel has the absolute right to defend itself against the horrific terrorist attack that happened on October 7th. But of course, we are urging, as always, in every single call, that humanitarian laws, um, innocent civilians must be taken into account for any operation. Um, you know, we do feel like they've been receptive to us. They they continue to engage in our calls, um, and that's a good sign. We want to keep those cu lines of communication open. And I'm sorry, you had a f first question yeah, that I, mean, I the like, level of engagement, mm -hmm. the department level of engagement in the daily. Sure. So from the secretary and then, of course, there are levels below him that engage with their Israeli counterparts. It's not just from the secretary's level. Of course, we have our policy team here. Um, the joint staff engages, you know, on, on their side. Um, so it's multiple, multiple levels, not just happening at the secretary level. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. So um, when you say you have daily discussions, and can you please give us a sense about, like, how the, uh, like, What's next? What are the goals of the Israelis? Uh, what's the way ahead in Gaza? Uh, like when sure. on day 41 or 42, I believe, and the Israelis couldn't achieve much by killing civilians uh, so far. So do they share their goals with, with you? on a daily basis. So again, I'm not going to get into the private conversations. We have readouts that we put out after every call. Um, and then we have engagements below the secretary's level that um, continue at, at all different levels and you know pretty regularly. Um, I'm just not going to get into any further details of those calls. We don't, we're not, the IDF, we're not on the ground. We're not um, in their operations, but we certainly ask the questions that we feel that we need to ask. Um, we push where we feel that we need to push, um, and that's what good partners do. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. Chris? Oh, did you have one more? Okay, one more and then I'll go to Chris. Yeah. So I just I want to ask you about if you still have the same level of concern about a wider conflict in the region. If, uh, even though like Hezbollah didn't uh, show intentions mm -hmm. to really engage in a comprehensive war uh, with Israel so far. Yeah, we absolutely have concerns of this widening out to a wider regional conflict, which is why we have positioned the assets in the region that we have um, with our two carrier strike groups, with um, more aircraft in the region. Um, with the 26 Mu also there um, that remains untasked, but you know, ready in, in case needed. Um, absolutely, that's why we're concerned. And that's why you, you saw the secretary at the direction of the president surge these assets to the region to, to make a statement and to make a statement to Iran that uh, getting involved or, or seeking a wider regional conflict is not the right course of action. Now I'll go to Chris. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. I, I just wanted to pick apart the uh, grade versus deterrence uh, element of these okay. airstrikes. You said they were um, significantly degraded, these militias' capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, if the department deems these, and the president deems these uh, strikes um, are necessary in the future, how feasible is it for the United States to destroy, to blow up enough of their capabilities that even if they want to, they can't attack U.S. forces? Well, that's just getting into details that I'm not going to speak to because that gets to also an intelligence assessment. So what I can say is that w when you were asking about degrade degraded versus deterrence, I mean, we degraded these facilities enough that they can't use them anymore. So they're completely destroyed. So uh, the ammunition or the weapons storage facility that is in Syria that we just hit um, this past Sunday, uh, those weapons are no longer usable. That means that those who, whatever groups were using those and wanting to inflict harm or more attacks on our troops can't use them anymore. So that's completely degraded their ability um, of at least another site to inflict damage on our troops. Joseph, yeah. Thanks. Um, one on the drone, the MQ-9. Can you can the Pentagon publicly attribute that to the Houthis that they launched that drone? I think it's, I mean, we know it came from Yemen. Again, we're still doing an assessment of the attribution, but I would have no reason to doubt that it would have come from the Houthis, but it's, you know, not like they sent a note with it. Sure. Yeah. All right, and the second one um, on Israel, a senior... Maybe that was more flippant than I needed to be, but you know what I mean. Like, we're still doing an assessment of yeah. of the of the ownership of, you know, who, who launched the drone, but we do know it came from Yemen. And uh, earlier today, a senior defense official said that this department is involved uh, in tracking civilian casualties uh, in Gaza, um, obviously as, as a result of both sides, but also the Israeli strikes um, in Gaza. 
Can you, uh, Civ CAS involved, can you elaborate at all? Um, and is there a report that's going to be coming out? I mean, we're over a month into the conflict now. I'm not sure what um, you're referencing by keeping track of civilian casualties in Gaza. I haven't. Based on, support, based on U.S. military support, too. Um, I haven't seen that. I mean, again, we, we do our own assessments, but I have nothing to read out of um, as we get information. Um, you know, again, we're not on the ground here. We know that um, the health ministry does put out uh, civilian casualty numbers, but that is run by Hamas. So we have to, you know, of course, take that with a bit of a grain of salt here. But I, I don't have an independent assessment on our side that we're doing right now. Are you guys asking the Israelis to try? I mean, obviously, they can't keep track of every single one when they're this high, the number. But are you guys asking them to keep track? That's not, I mean, that's something that uh, is going to be very difficult to keep track of. Um, and that's not something that I think we're directing them to do, but something that I think uh, most armies, you know, in their operations would keep track of just, you know, general casualties. But we're not asking for a count every day. Um, again, we do our own assessments, but I just don't have anything more for you on that. Yeah. North Korea announced that they successfully uh, test a whole solid fuel engine for intermediate range ballistic mm -hmm. missile. So do you think that this engine is related to the Russian technology that's going to be received from Russia? That I, I couldn't speculate on. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, he shared a detailed uh, animation uh, and the IDF as well of the Shifa hospital and uh, a, a detailed drawing of the Hamas uh, possible, uh, you know, uh, garrisons underneath the hospital building. Okay. So, uh, so far we saw only a couple of videos uh, established by or uh, broadcasted by the uh, IDF social media shows us a couple of assault rifles only. Since you have very close contact with your Israeli counterparts, do you have any information about solid uh, proof of these uh, animations that the Israeli prime minister shared before? I can't speak to the animations or video that you're speaking about. I just haven't seen it, so I'm not. I'm. It's hard for me to respond to exactly what you're referencing. Um, we were very clear on when I came out on Tuesday and can reiterate that we know that the hospital was used as a um, operation center for Hamas. They were using it. They were had their, you know, um, I don't know if leadership, but they had they had you know militants in there um, operating out of the the hospital. But I don't have more for you in terms of what you're referencing in terms of the video. Um, sorry. I have a couple on Ukraine, so could you please provide a preview of the next Ukraine Defense Contact Group meeting? Uh, I believe it's going to be the, the last meeting this year, so uh, what's the focus going to be on, and do you expect to hear any announcement about new aid packages, et cetera? Um, so I don't have an announcement yet for the next Ukraine Defense Contact Group, but you know that they meet uh, monthly, and so um, I think we should expect an announcement within the next few days of when the next one will be. Um, in terms of aid packages, You've seen us roll out pretty consistently aid packages uh, for Ukraine. Um, we have had to parse down our support and our security assistance for Ukraine because we don't have additional funding because the supplemental hasn't been passed. So we just rolled out our um, last presidential drawdown authority, and I, uh, I believe that was last week. Um, look, we're, we're, when we're ready to roll out the next one, we certainly will. We know that Ukraine continues to face um, and continues to um, endeavor in its counteroffensive, and they need continued support on a regular basis. So um, we know that we have to do that. We know that we have to continue to meet their needs. Um, and that's something that certainly will be discussed at the next Ukraine Defense Contact Group. But um, in terms of a package preview, I just don't have more for you to announce today. And for how long can you support Ukraine until? before the Congress looks into new funding, because like the last packages were like thinner and thinner we saw. Well, that's because uh, we don't have a supplemental. I mean, frankly, that, that is why we requested an emergency supplemental package to provide funding for, uh, or, sorry, security assistance to Ukraine and also to backfill our own stocks. Um, the supplemental, again, is, is in Congress. Uh, we continue to urge Congress to pass a supplemental. Um, it's, you know, a supplemental is put, put forward and and packaged together 
because it's an emergency request. It's not part of the budget process. And so um, we have a large amount that we want Congress to authorize for Ukraine and for Israel and for our investments in the Indo-Pacific and, of course, um, you know, for our own investments in our defense industrial base. Um, so that's something that we're going to continue to urge Congress to pass. But you're absolutely right. You have seen smaller packages because we need to parse these out. Um, because we don't know when Congress is going to pass our supplemental package. And so um, we're continuing to talk with allies and partners. Uh, we're not the only country here contributing to Ukraine's urgent battlefield needs. As you know, the Ukraine contact group is you know, over 50 nations. So um, it's not that it's just the U.S. supporting Ukraine, but the president has been very clear that we are going to stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. And so that means... Um, you know, Congress passing our supplemental request, um, and we hope that they do that soon. For how long do you th think you still have them before Congress looks into that? Like it's going to be weeks, months, or? Yeah, yeah, well, again, each package varies by dollar amount. So um, you've seen some smaller packages. I'm not going to forecast how long that's going to last. Um, that certainly wouldn't do the Ukrainians any good. That wouldn't, that, that would really benefit the Russians. Um, and so I'm just not going to be able to, you know, give you a timeline on how long we're going to be able to have these packages um, continue to go forward. But what I can say, and what I will continue to say, is that we need Congress to pass that supplemental request. Yes. Hi, you keep talking about the intelligence in the past tense, that you believe, the intelligence believes Hamas has used hospitals. Do you have intelligence that they currently are? I have only the intelligence that I read out, the downgraded intelligence that I read out yesterday, um, or sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, on Tuesday. Uh, past tense, present tense, I don't want to parse out words here, but we know that Hamas has been using the hospital, the Al-Shifa hospital, and other hospitals in Gaza. Um, I'm not going to get into more specifics on, you know, what they're doing now, whereabouts, all of that. We know that the IDF has taken control of Al Shifa Hospital, um, so I don't have more to to share with you on that front. It matters because under international law, you have to have proof that a uh, combatant is cu is currently right then in that moment in the hospital in order to strike. Yeah. yeah. Again, when I read out the downgraded material, we felt very confident that Hamas was using that hospital um, to conduct its operations. And as you saw in open source, um, there have been um, evidence of that that the IDF is, is showing now. Well, and that's what I want to ask mm -hmm. you. How would you characterize the video of the that the IDF released? They said it's irrefutable proof that Hamas was there. Do you, does the U.S. agree? I don't think we're disputing that Hamas was using Al-Shifa Hospital. I mean, I read that out on Tuesday. I said very specifically, Al-Shifa is one of many hospitals in Gaza that Hamas uses to operate out of and to con conduct their operations out of. So I'll let the IDF speak to their broader assessment. I mean, they're still ongoing right now, um, but I just don't have more for you or more intelligence to share, and I'm frankly not going to do it from this podium. One more. So sure. you're saying that the video of a blurred laptop, a flak jacket, a handful of rifles, that that backs up what you've been saying, that Hamas is operating in the hospital? I will. I'm happy to repeat what I said on Tuesday, but we, the, the downgraded intelligence that I read out on Tuesday and that I will reiterate again today is that Hamas uses, Al-Shifa being one of them, but hospitals in Gaza to conduct and to operate out of um, and, and to further execute on terrorist um, actions within Gaza. Does that video back that up? Again, yeah. I'm just going to leave it at that. Thanks. Did you have a question back here? Oh, sorry. Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sabrina. Regarding to the, um, as you mentioned, that uh, there were like uh, 58 attacks against uh, U.S. service members um, since uh, 17th of October. So do you have any plans to change your booster in Iraq and Syria, especially most of these uh, attacks happens in that in these two countries? and. Uh, how do you see uh, uh, the Iraqi government uh, uh, respond or react to protect these spaces? <coughs> do you believe they have the ability uh, to protect these spaces? Thank you. Uh, so I think your question was on um, force posture changes within Syria and Iraq. So I don't have any force posture changes to announce, but as you know, um, I can't remember the date, but we did we did announce that we were moving Patriot and Thad batteries into the region um, to help protect our troops with more air defense. So that's something that we have do, done to bolster our um, 
protection measures of our of our service members in both Iraq and Syria and elsewhere. Um, and all the Patriot batteries are there and fully running. And the THAAD battery, I believe, is still making its way over. But I don't have any more force posture movements to announce. What about the Iraqi government? Uh, how do, you, do you think they uh, they have the ability to protect the uh, bases that where the U.S. troops are being, uh, like in, uh, in Ambar or in the north of Iraq? Yes, we continue to work with the Iraqi government and their military in terms of protecting our troops. We are in Iraq at the invitation of the Iraqi government, so we certainly um, work with them and partner with them. And and they are, you know, the the secretary has had. had um, calls with his counterpart on making sure that our service members are protected in those areas, and we continue to engage them on, on in those conversations. Okay, thank you. Just sure. On that. Um, mm-hmm. on and then we got to we got to wrap. Sorry. Yeah, Tuesday you said fifty five attacks since October yes. seventeen. We're here in different numbers. Is that what's the what's the latest? Sorry, I can give you that rundown. So as of today, there have been approximately fifty eight attacks. So that's twenty seven in Iraq and 30, 31 attacks in Syria. Yeah. You have to have one more quick. I'll be quick. Okay, Fadi. Yeah, one no, more. No, th- but then I feel like I have to do Tony. No, so, okay, no, no, I'll do no, these I, two and then, and I, then, no, then no, I got to wrap it up. I give it to you. Yeah. Very generous okay. with your time. Okay. Um, it, um, based on the intelligence yeah. that was recently downgraded that you talked mm-hmm. about on Tuesday, and based on any other information that is available to you, how recent did Hamas leadership use a Shifa hospital? Well, that would get into further intelligence assessments that I just can't get into from the, from from here. Um, again, as I as I mentioned earlier, but and I told you, we we feel very confident that Hamas was using Al Shifa and other hospitals uh, to conduct operations out of. Um, but I, just in terms of when, where, all of that, um, more specifics, I just can't get into those details. I, Did I you have a question? PDA sure. issue. Just to clarify for the record and for those watching, don't, doesn't the Pentagon have about four point nine billion dollars of authority left? Yeah for PDAs, they just don't have, they've got like a billion dollars left to replace their equipment, but they, you can give like four billion, 4.9 billion in PDAs going forward. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize it. I'm just trying to tell you that, yes, we do have $4.9 billion in, from the recalculated PDA funds that we continue to draw down of. That's, that's what we're using. But we only have 1.1, I believe, left to restock our own inventories. And so, again, we know Ukraine is going to need more than that. Right. And so that's why we did submit that supplemental request. And a lot of that supplemental will be used also to replenish our own stocks. I just want to make the point that it's not that it's not getting cut off yet. you got $4 billion, yep. and only $5 billion left to play out however long that goes. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks, everyone.